Okay, now I will be introducing uh, this keynote presenter, who is Sean Walker. Uh, Sean Walker, RMH PhD, is a clinical academic midwife. She is based at King's College London, where she is an NHR Advanced Fellow and Senior Research Fellow. She is currently conducting feasib feasibility work for a clinical trial of OptiBridge Care, a complex intervention based on her team's previous research about physiological bridge birth practice and service delivery. Clinically, clinically uh, she works as an uh, honorary consultant midwife at Chelsea and Westminster Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust, where she coordinates the interpartum bridge team and the bridge clinic at the West Middlesex Hospital. For the information about her work, can be found at this website that I will post on the web chat, uh, bridgebirth.org.uk and optibridge.uk. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, thank you very much, Sean, and I will give you. Okay. okay, so thanks thanks so much, those of you who've come to hear this presentation. Um, as Ellie explained, I'm currently about halfway through a three-year NIHR Advanced Fellowship, which is um, funding my training in clinical trials and looking at the feasibility of doing another term breach trial based on um, team care for breach births and um, the use of breach specialist midwives who have experience and training in physiological breach birth. So what is physiological breach birth? Um, a definition is an approach to facilitating vaginal breach birth centered on the optimization and restoration of normal physiological processes, including upright positioning. Um, and we say that because, I mean, I have to say when I first started doing this research, I thought that what I was researching was upright breach birth and it very soon became clear to me that that it was a tool and not a rule of physiological breach birth, that the main focus of any physiological birth is to optimize the physiological process and sometimes women are on their back, sometimes they're on their side. Lots of women like to be up on their knees but that is a tool and not a rule. So how do you feasibility test for a trial? Um, the outcomes we are looking for in our feasibility test are, are we able to provide trained and proficient attendants? Now, as you can imagine, this is a bit of a challenge at the moment after decades worth of depletion in skills. So that's a feasibility question. Do they provide consistent care? That's a fidelity question. Do they provide care in a way that's acceptable to women and staff? So it's acceptability. And do we maintain low neonatal admission rates? That's a safety question. Um, in this bit of the observational study, we're not looking at extensive safety data. We're just basically looking at any neonatal admissions or neonatal deaths. Um, we haven't had any neonatal deaths within 28 days, and we um, have had a level of neonatal emissions that's similar to the UK average um, for all births. Um, but the bigger collection of safety data will come in the actual trial. So this is a kind of precursor to a trial where you test to see if it's going to be possible to do a trial. And do we get adequate recruitment rates? And that's a feasibility question. Now, what are the needs of the service and the research? Um, we need to have counseling by a trained and proficient team member, intrapartum care by a trained and proficient team member. We have to have training for the OptiBreach team member and the wider team, service development and risk management and recruitment. Um, and what is a breach clinic? Um, we have found that the sites that have breach clinic have better recruitment rates because every woman with a breach pregnancy is going through those clinics. And a breach clinic is a dedicated space and time to see women with suspected or confirmed breach presentation. It's staffed by midwives and obstetricians with a special interest in training. We do bedside ultrasound scans, counseling, moxibustion referral from 34 weeks is part of our guideline at Chelsea and external cephalic versions, which are at, certainly at Chelsea and West Middlesex are done by midwives and birth planning, no matter what your mode of birth. 
Um, the original plan in the feasibility study study was for the funding for the release of staff for training five obstetricians and five senior midwives and um, along with a breach lead obstetrician and breach lead midwife this was going to be in-person training followed by cascade training um, I got my grant award notice in the middle of March 2020 and um, there was a few other things going on right at that time so as you can imagine um, the events associated with COVID-19 severely impacted research across the country and in the trial. It was very difficult to organize in-person training. So what actually happened was I put the entire online training package online. We are now starting to go back to one-to-one on training, basically, it was then cascaded by specialists internally who could cascade the training locally, and it was primarily done by a breach specialist midwife, either formally or informally. I always knew that I would have a significant role at my trusts, but what we found is that that role ends up being really significant no matter what trust it is, and the ones that are significantly participating in the feasibility study, um, that role seems to be really significant. So what do we do as breach specialist midwives? So we do counseling and birth planning along with other clinic duties. So a typical um, clinic day for me at West Middlesex Hospital will be um, presentation scans that are referred from community suspected breach presentations from 9 to 10. From 10 to about 12.30, I will have follow-up appointments for people that we know are breached, so they're having a bit further counseling about um, whether they want to turn the baby or planning their mode of birth, and then in the afternoon, external cephalic versions. Um, and then being on call for births and organizing the interpartum care. Um, so if I am seeming a little bit slow today, it's because I've actually been out through the night with a birth um, that ended at 5.08 and I've only recently managed to get a shower for the day. So I've made it in time. But um, so I was with that that woman so she was she was actually a self-referral so we keep track of where women are coming from whether they're referred by their midwife internally their obstetrician a staff member from another hospital who might be referring to us or are the women themselves referring to us and we're finding that 20 participants actually come from outside of our Opti Breach hospitals and they find out through the website where they can ac access Opti Breach care. Um, so we do face-to-face -face training with the Opti Breach team and wider um, multidisciplinary team. We facilitate reflections on births other, that other people have been to um, and the recruiting for the trial. So this is a very unique um, trial because we are now this, what I'm presenting is about our observational phase to see if we could provide team care with the sites who demonstrated they were able to provide team care. We are now in a pilot trial where we're randomizing to opti breach care or standard care. And um, it's a very unique study in that the vast majority of our principal investigators, that's the person who leads the study locally, are midwives. And traditionally, principal investigators have always been obstetricians where and midwives will help collect the research data. Data. This study is actually led by midwives with, my, with myself as a chief investigator and with local principal investigators. Um, but we always work hand in hand with our breach lead obstetrician at each site, and um, they will be aware of who's planning a vaginal breach birth and have checked in with them, done any additional counseling that is needed. They do a second review to make sure we're not missing any anything in the that we need to take into consideration for the birth. So if you look, so at the time I prepared this presentation, there were 68 women planning a VBB. Um, I know that we are at over 70 now. Um, and if you see that the three main sites, which are now currently in the trial, um, the first three sites, they each had a formal specialist midwife that was a recognized post, and that was part of our job descriptions. And two of us had a dedicated specialist clinic. Um, the third did not have a dedicated specialist clinic, although that is in progress. But interestingly, because their midwife had so much experience, that site received the bulk of referrals um, and the, in fact they got multiple referrals from a site that didn't have a specialist midwife or a um, or a 
team. So if you see, but then there are people who are kind of informally functioning as a specialist midwife and um, and one of the sites, I also support one of the other hospitals in London. So I went to a birth there last week. So I'm kind of an outside support that I come in on an honorary contract and support them to develop their skill. And in site G, we're having a natural um, experiment called Breach Specialist Midwife Goes on Maternity Leave. So far, their site have recruited two people um, as she's awaiting the arrival of her baby. So she's very pleased with her team. Um, Oops, sorry, I went too fast. So the mode of birth. So at the time I prepared this, there were 63 births that had occurred. There were 49% were vaginal breech births, 3.2 were forceps breech. Um, so there were assistants with forceps to the after coming head. Um, 3.2 were cephalic births because that is one of the outcomes. 12% of babies, if you just wait to go into labor with multips, 12% will just turn to head down. We had one where everybody was very worried because someone saw the neck, two failed versions. There was a good deal of worry, but we were very clear that the evidence doesn't say we should be excluded including a trial of a labor, a nuchal cord. And indeed, as I was getting off my bike, I got a text to say baby's cephalic, the water back to perineum. Emergency cesarean section is 28.6%. So that is in the of a VBAC emergency C-section rate and elective cesarean section rate. Some of those are for indications and some people change their mind. Opti breach is not about promoting vaginal breach birth as the best option. And in fact, the women who contributed to the design of the study didn't want the study to find a, a best opted, the choice that was right for them. Um, and so we, women always have the option to change their mind and have an elective section. And we've had all sorts of things like that happen. Sometimes people change their mind, change them back, and that's okay. What we actually find is that um, our elective, when you start increasing choice for vaginal breach birth, your elective section rate goes up as well because it, some people just want to go straight to elective. Um, the vaginal birth rate goes up as well. So if you look at um, how this compares to, you know, our gold standard in the UK is Oxford for external cephalic version. And, um, they have clearly have a much higher vaginal rate after the ECV with 82%. The instrumental is 28. Um, any vaginal birth through that clinic is 43.6%. And that in that it includes all of the ECV attempts because most unsuccessful ECVs have a, a cesarean section. So in terms of our feasibility outcomes, you can see the definition of what we consider proficient. That they've completed our physiological breech birth training package, which is through the breech birth, attended at least 10 vaginal breech births, including resolution of complications, attended or taught in simulation at least three vaginal breech births within the past year, and um, they need to say that they need to self-assess themselves as competent to autonomously attend births. Um, now, we say autonomously, that doesn't mean that we're not working as an MDT team. This is very much about creating space for phys physiological birth on the labor ward where we're all working in harmony. You know, that is still a goal because any change, if you are a research leader, you are also a change leader. And that, you know, that's a process. That's not something that happens overnight just because we're suddenly have a vaginal breech birth study. But so far we're doing well. Um, someone was present throughout the second stage who had completed the training 90.9% .9 of the time. And that's consistent with other continuity of care models. We always have to counsel women that there's always going to be a degree of unpredictability. And what we hope is that through the and annual mandatory training, the, the, the strategies that we use filter across the entire team. Everyone has completed the enhanced training. And um, if you give birth very quick, we sometimes did make sure someone's um, there. So someone was present who met all of of these proficiency criteria, which I think are quite stringent by today's standards, 73% of the time. So we think that that's really pretty good. We're happy with that, especially given that some of the sites started out saying, 
we don't think we're going to be able to meet that at all. We can get someone there who's done the training, but we don't actually have anyone who meets. And this is oftentimes including their consultant body. Okay, so this is, it's, it's a dire state, the uh, state of breach services at the moment. Um, and so we're just trying to figure out how we get from A to B to, um, to start something that is safe. Um, the maternal birth position was upright, 72.7. So um, that isn't something where we have a target for. It's just basically, yes, we're providing that as an option. We can see that that is happening. Um, we use maternal movement and effort always as a frontline strategy stalls. So we follow the physiological breach birth algorithm that was based on our previous research, but we use something we call continuous cyclic pushing. That means that once the pelvis begins to be born, we keep things moving. Most women will keep it moving themselves, but like say it pauses, then you'll hear me say something like, okay, well done. Now take a deep breath and when you're ready, push again, or give it a wiggle. You want to move that baby down. Um, and that keeps things moving. We're not doing hold your breath, push while self or pushing continuously for five minutes. We are doing continuous cyclic pushing where it more actively mimics the kind of several pushes per contraction that women do physiologically. So we, it wasn't necessary to do that. So 18% of the time, those were births that needed no intervention whatsoever. Yes, we did use encouragement about 67% of the time, and then 15% for whatever reason that wasn't recorded, wasn't used, or um, maybe someone was using different strategies. So um, there were 31 successful vaginal beach births, and was there less than five minutes between the birth of the pelvis and the birth of the head? Yes, 80, almost 88%. We've changed that for rumping to rumping. So if you see in the picture, that's what we call rumping, rather than the birth of the pelvis, because we realized that we are further research which you can see on the right, especially the, the study done by Emma Spillane, which looked at um, retrospective records and compared birth, death, or neonatal admission. And it's much longer range and higher risk association with um, on the perineum, as well as delay following the birth of the umbilicus, more so than the out. So we really want to keep things moving once the baby comes down onto the perineum. And that's what I usually counsel women about as well, because they need to know if you are going to have an episiotomy, that's usually when I'm going to suggest that it's a good idea because the baby has stalled on the perineum and we really need to keep things moving at that point. So safety data, neonatal admission or neonatal death. Um, in Five of the trusts they were able to give us from the two years previous to Opti breach. In those years, there were 61 vaginal breach births. 13% of them were admitted to higher level care. And there were two neonatal deaths for a composite outcome of 16% neonatal admission or death. At the nine Opti breach sites, um, vaginal breach births had a 9.1% um, admission rate. And if you were looking at it prospectively, the national average is five for all babies at term, and it, it was 5% including the emergency cesareans. So safety data is severe morbidity or mortality. We have had one that we know about in the observational study that as um, severe, and so of the actual vaginal breach birth, there was one severe outcome um, where the baby was admitted for more than four days and had an APGAR of less than four at five minutes. And in the term breach trial, the rate was 5.5% and Primoda was 1.6%. The Primoda was a prospective observational study, so that would have been all planned breach births. So our rate is also um, at the moment 1.6% for the total planned prospective births. Um, we're also doing interviews with women, try to get a range of voices. So we look across sites, we look for vaginal breech births as well as like for forceps births, two cesarean sections and elect sections where women have changed their minds. That's where we knew there were difficulties. As you might imagine with a study like this, there are frequently strong opinions about the way that things should be done. It's it's not always smooth sailing. Um, some 
Women have chosen to give more outside of the midwife-led unit, although the, our protocol is to recruit unit. It's not working. We looked at some slowly recruiting sites and one where there was a neonatal admission. For, for our analysis, we're using the theoretical framework of acceptability, which looks at um, different ways of judging how acceptable a service is for participants or staff. And I'm just going to have a And the three main kind of themes that we identified that were needs that women have of the service and mechanisms and why we decided to focus on breach specialist midwives because they were the mechanisms by which women were able to have these needs met. The first was balanced information. They needed access to skilled breach care and shared responsibility. So balanced information. It's very clear in the interviews with women that they are getting balanced information from the counseling. Certainly when I counsel women, I use a pro forma. I say the same thing every time according to what our guidelines and the RCOG guidelines say about risk. I say it in a non-emotive fashion and a non-judgmental fashion. It's all on an open hand and you can choose what you want. And they're saying things like um, nothing was sort of pushed on me. She didn't sugarcoat anything. She um, she told me exactly what the potential risks could have been, but also what the benefits could be. So they really appreciate that they're getting the full access to information. Um, but they're saying that oftentimes it costs, there's a big opportunity cost for women to get that information, especially a lot of women who've had to transfer from outside into our trust, um, they have had a hard time accessing the information on their own. They feel that they haven't gotten balanced information until they enter that A. Now, they're not getting the same type of counseling from everyone at hospitals, so they are reporting um, different um, levels of information. But what they're saying about the breach specialist midwife, one of the things that I was really surprised about is that they really liked when we talked them through the potential complications in detail and exactly what we would do if the head got stuck, if the arms got stuck, if we did need to do an episiotomy. They, that detail was reassuring to them because they could, and they could make a decision about whether they were willing to do that. Um, rather than just People, people tend to feel really panicky when you say the baby's head could get trapped because that's an image of like there and then what and if you don't kind of talk about how you're going to resolve that 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 could take a short amount of time or a long amount of time and that is somewhat what the skill depends on the skill um but they are saying that um the the access to skilled breach care they are needing kind of outside help to help them put in touch with the skilled breach care. So if you have a specialist that um, women feel like, oh, there's going to be likely that someone will be at my birth who is familiar with breach birth, is actually supported. The last interview that I did, the woman said, I think they were really looking forward to it. And that, that actually makes a really big difference for women to know that actually my birth is going to be attended by people who are looking forward to supporting me having this birth rather than people who are judging me and upset that I'm choosing to have a breech birth and feeling put out that um, I'm making this choice. That That's important. And it was easier. So the women who were booked at Opti Breach sites and just were automatically referred to the breech specialist midwife found it really easy. They didn't have the same conflicts and and kind of um, difficulties accessing support, um, and so that was that was made it more acceptable to them. Now, one of the things that we've identified, and some students of mine have done a systematic review, which also indicates women who want to plan a vaginal breach birth have an enormous emotional burden placed on them, and even um, you know just about every interview that we have done confirms the same qualitative data that women receive a lot of judgment. They have criticism from their friends and family. They have criticism from providers. They And when 
we have meetings of our patient involvement group, it's very frequent that someone will cry, even people who've had very good outcomes, just because they've been so stressed by the way that people have spoken to them and the trauma that it has caused that people were so upset about their decision to plan a vaginal breach birth and ask them, well, why are you doing that? And, and things like that. So I just think that we need to be really mindful of that, that if we're going to say that this is a choice, it needs to be a choice a genuine choice and people shouldn't have to feel that they have to actually fight their care providers in order to access it. Um, but one of the things that we find is that when you have a team that is saying, well, we can't give you an absolute guarantee, but we will do our best to be there. So for example, last evening I was getting texts from the woman whose birth I was at this morning saying, okay, so um, the consultant said that if you're not there, then someone from her team would look after me. Is that is that right? Is there going to be experience there? And I said, look, we can never offer you 100% guarantee. I'm going to do my best to get there. Members of my team are going to do my best, our best to get there. But at the end of the day, birth is unpredictable. So um, you have to be willing to deal with me. And so I said, I suggest that what you do is you close your eyes and visualize that everything is aligning and everything is being set up as much as we possibly can support you. And she said, okay, that's really reassuring. And I kid you not, 10 minutes later, her partner called me and said that her waters had broken. So clearly she was feeling a strong need to feel like everything was in place. And then once she realized it was, she could relax and, um, and go into labor. But what they say is that instead of everyone telling them basically you're putting your baby at risk and this is your responsibility, having a breach team that's willing to be on call for them is a matter of sharing responsibility. They still know that it's their informed decision. They ultimately, they live with their their decisions, any adverse outcomes that they need to live with for the rest of their lives, those are their decisions to, to live with. But knowing that there are people there who have practiced, done extra training and are um, prepared to be there makes a really big difference to the amount of um, trust they feel. And that extended to the rest of the team unless they spoke to people where that expressed the judgment and disapproval of their decisions. Then they started really focusing on the breach specialist midwife and saying, I don't want anyone else but this person. Um, whereas if they had good interactions, they trusted that all of the team was there working together to be with them. Um, and they, um, and there were mixed views for the teams, which made sense to us because the teams are still very much developing. Like I said, COVID has had a massive impact. There has not been extra staff time to release people for training the way that we anticipated. They're, we're doing the best that we can, but it's not exactly how we anticipated. So we have frequent um, public involvement and engagement meetings. Um, many participants have emphasized that um, the value of more information and more time. They want earlier information about breach presentation. So a lot of women are told, don't worry, don't worry, your baby could still turn. But actually, if your baby is breached at 33 weeks, there's still a, a significant chance if it's your first baby that it's going to be breached at 36 weeks. So only about 25% of them will turn. So, um, it, so it's fair to women to say if they want information to give them information earlier so that they can make informed decisions about turning what they want to do. So what we know, I'm going to wrap up now, is that an OptiBreach Specialist Midwife operationalized within the service is highly acceptable to women and we've just been awarded a grant to try to um, increase the impact of this research so that more um, sites will develop breach specialist midwife roles. The more formalized, visible, and local the role is, the more it meets women's needs for access to balanced information and shared responsibility. And it's a really good implementation strategy. So I've now begun telling sites, it won't get off the ground unless you have a breach specialist midwife, because we're just not seeing it work unless you have someone taking responsibility to lead in this way, in collaboration with the breach lead obstetrician. So how will the role develop over time? We don't know. 
how will it transition to become less dependent on one person and how long will it take? Like I said, we're really pleased that the, the, that the site where the breech specialist midwife is on maternity leave is continuing to support breech births. Really happy for them. Um, how, what is the best way for the multidisciplinary team to work together? And of course, our ultimate goal is to find out what are the safety outcomes. But in order to find out if we've made breech births safer, we actually have to have some breech births. When you do a trial, you have something called a logic model. I won't bore you with it, but this is how all of the different pieces work together to result in the outcome for this complex intervention known as OptiBreach Care. And in our pilot trial, there are 104 women across four sites with the aim is to increase the vaginal birth rate for those who want it by providing the safest possible option of vaginal breech birth, a high actance rate of ECV and a high success rate of ECV. And um, we obviously won't be sharing the results until they're in because this is a trial. A few of these women have already given birth. So we're already halfway through um, the, well, over halfway through the recruitment and 52 women have given birth. So we're feeling good about our ability to recruit to a future trial. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm really happy, oh, well, this is what standard care is in, um, in OptiBridge Care. But I'm really happy to answer any questions that you have about um, the work that I'm doing and or share anything that you want to share. You can come on in or type whichever you prefer. Um, Celine, it, are there a lot of US midwives who are practicing palpation skills? What do you mean by that? I mean, because we always use palpation prior to any scans and in labor prior to any vaginal examination. So our palpation skills are really important. And even though I've been scanning for some time, I actually think that the scanning improves my palpation skills from the immediate feedback. So my hands and my mini scanner kind of work symbiotically now. But um, do you want to say more about what you want to know about midwifery practice as far as palpation goes? Diana Powell Baldrone is saying that she feels we're lucky in Europe that vaginal breech birth hasn't been lost. Um, one thing I would say, Diana, is despite I'm obviously in Europe, I'm not 100% sure that it hasn't been. I certainly don't feel like I feel that we are rediscovering breech birth with this trial and this study. I feel that it is every day I realize how much actually has been lost that um, isn't, hasn't been shared and can't be shared in training because of it having been underground for quite so long. Um, so, um, but there are certain guiding light sites in Europe, certainly, that are doing quite a lot of good support, which is wonderful. Um, so. Ella Kane from Norfolk is saying, how are you recruiting for additional sites? At the moment, I'm not actively recruiting for additional sites because we have nearly 20 sites in the observational study. So it's more of a, if people are coming to me and to us and saying they want to get involved, then we kind of put them on a list for the next time I go to put an amendment in. There is quite a lot of sites that haven't managed to open as well, because again, there have been difficulties with COVID and the R&D departments. Um, 
Birmingham Women's is just about to come on board as another trial site because you have to participate in the observational study and demonstrate that you can put a team in place before you can come on to the trial. But um, once the trial is over and we know the results and we know whether the trial steering committee has made a decision that it is feasible to do this in in a large trial, then we will be looking for further sites for the substantive trial at the same time as looking for money for the substantive trial. Um, so Celine is saying, thinking about places without US facilities. Um, okay, and the choice for birth location, like I said, we, everyone, one of the things that was important to women was that they women retained as much choice as possible. So um, women, we say, you know, what we're really trying hard to do is create space for physiological breech birth on a multidisciplinary unit. But there have been several women who have given birth on midwifery units and several women who have given birth at home. And that choice is definitely available to women in the UK because one of the ways that UK National Health Service care differs from, say, that in the US is that the National Health Service um, owes a um, duty of care to every woman. So, for example, we have had women who were booked under private care who've come out of private care because private care in the UK doesn't actually owe a duty of service. If they feel that they can't offer a vaginal breech birth, they just say, we can't offer you a vaginal breech birth at our facility. Whereas the NHS has a duty to provide care for women regardless of their choices. Um, so, and Catherine is saying, are you familiar with the Vaginal Breach Initiative at George Washington University Hospital? Yes, very much so. And that's a wonderful multidisciplinary team. Any practicing skills about ECV? Um, but is there practicing skills about ECV? Um, yes, so certainly. I do ECVs along with other breach specialist midwives in the project um, and that I know there's a huge tradition in, in the Netherlands of midwives doing ECVs and um, I would like to bring it as a kind of national um, competency that we have that is uniform throughout the UK. We have kind of trust level approved competencies but we really need to do that on a national level. Um, so Diana says she's speaking from Paris where it's an option in many places to still offer it, but not so many midwives. Yes, and um, the other thing is physiological breech birth is not necessarily, so the different centers that practice breech birth throughout Europe, the rates of using, for example, induction and augmentation and um, uh, enabling women to be upright and active versus on their backs in stirrups, mandated, um, that all varies considerably from center to center. So um, I work with quite a few hospitals, one in um, the Erasmus Hospital in Brussels where they use upright techniques and um, in Amsterdam OLVG where I'm, where I'm going in July, we do a lot of work together, and and Open Row in um, Denmark, where we were at the end of March teaching obstetricians from all over Scandinavia, um, where about 85% of women who have a breech presenting baby attempt a vaginal breech birth, and they tend to prefer the upright method. They're doing huge amounts of teaching, um, and um, it was wonderful. Um, so Celine taught ECV to doctors, but it was not allowed to do it to midwives and seems not part of the practicing field. Yes, again, and I think that was considered by the International Confederation of Midwives, whether ECV would become a midwife skill, and it was not voted on to be one of the core, and I think along with ultrasound. So very much so we consider these skills extended midwifery roles. So um, just like any other extension of practice. So in the UK, there is a tradition of specialist midwives. We have diabetic specialist midwives, 
perineal specialist midwives, perinatal mental health specialist midwives. Um, we have so we have a large number of specialist midwives who are considered to have specialist expertise in their practice area. Um, and a lot of my early research focused on exactly what are the competencies that a midwife needs to have an ECV competence um, and to attend upright vaginal breech births. So um, that's what we are doing, kind of translating that then into practice. So we have the kind of consensus-based guidelines. Now, what does it look like to implement the consensus-based guidelines about how you train midwives to fulfill these roles? And then what are the outcomes once you do implement it? And so we're kind of um, in between two and three at the moment in terms of implementing it and evaluating what the outcomes are when you have implemented it. So Ellie is saying that we need to start wrapping up and um, I thank you very, very much for the time that you've spent coming to listen to this presentation. And you can, of course, follow us on um, the OptiBreach website. You can follow that for updates and you can, um, the Physiological Breach training is available via the Breach Birth Network. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean, and thank you everyone for joining us.